All right, let's try that again. So I'm here today to talk about uh, Condi, Nestmates, and Constable, um, taking a look at some of the JDK 11 and 12 uh, JVM features. So I'm Dan Heidinga, I'm one of the Open J9 guys. Um, so Open J9 is a JVM from IBM, now at the Eclipse Foundation. It was open sourced last year. Um, and so the examples that I'm gonna talk about today, you know, I've run them on Open J9, but there's nothing in here that's particularly Open J9 specific. Okay, so is everybody aware of the change in the release cadence for the JDK? Okay, I'm seeing lots of, lots of hands up and nodding. Um, but yeah, I, I think I can explain that. Um, so historically releases have been every two to five years and there's been a massive amount of features that go into those releases. Um, with starting after Java 9, releases are now every six months. And so that means the things that are going into those releases are much smaller features. You're getting smaller incremental releases. So you're getting more things more quickly um, but those things aren't necessarily going to be as big as the features you got in previous releases. You're going to see little bits sort of build up in that release pipeline until you get sort of all the value out of it um, eventually down the line. Now, that's really important for a room like this is to get people like you who are, you know, interested in the JVM and interested in the new features to come and try them out, to test them out, and to provide early feedback, um, right? Before some of these features show up in the language, they show up in the bytecode. And so we want people like you to test them and let us know that, you know, the semantics work well for you and, and any rough edges you may run into. All right, so if we take a look at JDK 11, there are two features in particular that really affect the uh, JVM specification and the Java language specification, and that's nestmates and condi or nest-based access control and um, dynamic constants. So let's start by taking a look at nestmates. Um, what I'm gonna do for nestmates is I'm gonna show you some example code, um, code that's worked for years and years and years, and what really changes here is how it gets compiled. But let's look at you know how it used to get compiled before we start to talk about what a nest actually is. So here's a very simple example of an inner class it has a private variable, um, private int f, and then from a method in the outer class, I try to read that variable. All right, this is very straightforward code, nothing surprising here. Um, and it compiles before, it compiles today. But what you get when you compile it is a little bit surprising. All right, this is the bytecode you get. And the important part to notice here is that invoke static on line 10. Um, it's a dollar inner, so we're calling a method on the inner class. And the method has a funny name, access dollar zero zero zero, right? The code you would expect here is a get field, right? You really wanna get access to that field, so you'd expect the VM to generate the get field for you, not this kind of odd method. So what's in that method? Well, that method has the get field we expected. That's odd. And it's a synthetic method, which means that the Java C compiler generated it for us or some other compiler generated it. It doesn't reflect back into your source code. Um, and the, there's a reason that we need these methods. And that's because there's a mismatch between what the VM believes the access control rules are and what the Java language believes the access control rules are. So if we look at what those rules say, for the VM spec, and this is before Java 11, um, the spec said, private variables are only accessible inside of their class. The Java language said they're accessible inside the same class and inside any nested classes. Right, so right off the bat, we have this misalignment between the VM and the language, which is okay. There's lots of ways to handle that. There's lots of other places where there's misalignments. Um, they're not, they're just a matter of what translation strategy you choose to, uh, to expose things but sometimes that translation strategy can cause you some problems. So the kinds of problems we see here is that you get these bridge methods. And why do you care that you get them? Well, for the most part, most of the time you don't. You know, you get this extra layer of wrapping on your method, which means there's another method you have to load and verify and you know, the JIT will see through it and inline through it and, and so it 
there's no real actual cost most of the time, um, except a, you know, a tiny amount of memory here and there. But the, and I guess I should point out that it widens the access, but you know, the odds of being able to do anything particularly interesting or useful with that slightly widened access are pretty low given the names uh, aren't stable. Um, you know, that dollar zero 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 number just increments, so anytime you change the class, you're going to get a different method. Um, but the big one that seems to catch people, and it doesn't catch them very often, but when it does, it's a giant pain, is reflection. So let's look at another example. Here's another inner class example. Um, we have an outer class. It has an inner class with a method in it, a private method. And when we try to call that regularly, Java C generates an access bridge for us and the call just works. But if I wanted to do this with reflection instead, you know, I look up the declared method, I get it, and I attempt to invoke it. What happens? Illegal, Illegal access error. Right? And this again is the, the problem of the VM and the, um, the Java language having a different view of access. Right? So the Java language, though, says that something like this is a nest. Right? Class A, or your outer class, and all the classes that are defined inside it, inside the same source file, are a nest. Because you have to compile them at the same time, they really form a single trust domain. And so you'd like the VM to be able to use that same trust domain that the, the Java language uses. Um, right? Because class B, C, and D are part of A, you only compile them at the same time, uh, the VM should be able to say, you know, the, the private methods should be accessible. So we needed to make some class file format changes to make that work. And the ones we had to do were to add two attributes. Uh, the first attribute we had to add was the nest members attribute. And this gets added to the host class. Uh, so in my example here, class A is the outer class. Um, the Java source file is named for class A. So it's going to get the nest members attribute. And its nest members are going to be a list of all the inner classes that it defines. Um, so it would say uh, B, C, and D. And then each one of those classes that are defined in it have a nest host attribute. And they say, hi, my nest host is class A. Now there's a reason that we need both of these, and that's so that nobody can insert themselves into the nest after the fact. This is a bi-directional check. Um, which means that the host has to believe you're in its nest and you have to believe you're part of the nest before the private access is accessible. Um, and the other interesting thing about this is if you write JVMTI agents and you're used to being able to modify these things, this particular attribute, you're not allowed to modify with agents. Um, th and the VM will enforce that. So you can't just sort of uh, generate some code along the way and add yourself to the nest. And then, you know, class file data, we like to expose it reflectively. So there's APIs on class to be able to get access to this, get nest host, get nest members, and you can check your nest mate access. You know, the, the standard kind of reflective APIs that you'd want. And then reflection is updated and method handles are updated to allow this kind of private access if you're inside the nest, right? Great, so we've made the VM's view of private access the same as the languages. And you're probably thinking at this point, why do I care, right? The interesting thing is it's a pretty minor change. It doesn't affect very many people, but we have managed to remove an entire class of bugs, right? These reflective access bugs are, uh, or the reflective access ones due to uh, the private methods or private fields is now a class of bugs that doesn't exist. We've solved that for anything that's been recompiled. Now, the more interesting thing um, to people in this room is if you do bytecode generation, now you are able to target private methods with invoke virtual and invoke interface. And surprisingly, from a VM perspective, uh, at least in our implementation, this was the hardest piece of this to implement. The rest of it's fairly trivial. Um, but we don't, in J9, we don't put private methods in our V tables, so we had to do some interesting hackery to work around this, uh, which I'm happy to go into later, but I, I figured I'd keep uh, talking about nestmates now. All right, so where do we go with nestmates in the future? Well, I said it was a bi-directional check, 
But where we'd really like to take this is for some trusted APIs to allow them to insert into the nest dynamically. Uh, you know, today people do things like use um, unsafe define anonymous class to get around some of these access checks and to do some other um, slightly crazier things. And we'd like to make that standard API. And the way to do that is probably through method handles lookup, uh, providing some new APIs there that'll let you dynamically inject into the uh, into this nest. So, you know, keep your eyes uh, peeled for some future changes that way. All right, so Nestmates cleaned up some technical debt, made it a little easier to uh, generate the byte code you wanted to generate in the first place. Let's talk a little bit about Condi. All right, so it's fun to make fun of the name of constant dynamic because constant means unchanging and dynamic means you know, constantly changing. Um, but really, the name makes sense in that it's a dynamically computed constant. Right, so you get that option to get the up call into Java to make your constant, and then it stays unchanging after that. All right, so to talk about Condi, we actually have to go back to Java 7 and talk about Invoke Dynamic. So here is your very fast Invoke Dynamic refresher course. Um, the Invoke Dynamic bytecode refers to um, a constant pool index, which gives you the data to tell you how to bootstrap this. So the first time we go to run our Invoke Dynamic, it's unresolved, and so we need to do something to resolve it. Other bytecodes in the VM have hard-coded rules on how that resolution works. So you go to run the bytecode, the VM says, here's the list of rules from the Java specification that tell me what method or field or, or thing I'm going to do at this point. Invoke Dynamic, on the other hand, says, I'm going to call some user-supplied code, a, a bootstrap method, and let that user code define what happens here. So it makes an up call into Java code. Uh, this is Java code you've written or somebody else has written. In my particular example here, I'm showing the uh, bytecode that's generated for a Lambda expression. So we run the Lambda meta factory, it figures out what it needs to do, and to complete the invocation, it returns a call site, because every invoke dynamic instruction has to be linked to a call site. And that call site has to link to a method handle that has whatever the operation you want. And then after that, we are permanently linked to that call site. And for some types of call sites, you can change whatever the target method handle is. Right. So this is Invoke Dynamic. We've had this since Java 7. You know, Once you have this, this is sort of the ultimate Swiss Army knife. Why do you want anything else? I'm, I'm only kind of joking. We've, uh, Remy's not here this year, but he's usually the first guy to suggest everything can be implemented uh, with Invoke Dynamic. And he's usually right, it can. I'm not sure it's the implementation you want, but you can do it. So, you know, why do you want something more? Well, Invoke Dynamic came about in Java 7 because we looked at dynamic languages and said it's really hard to make fast calls. Um, there's a large amount of simulation overhead to do this, right? Uh, dynamic languages at the time were doing a lot of reflective calls, which were boxing everything into objects, collecting them into arrays, and then making the calls and unboxing. And this was you know, highly megamorphic, and JITs didn't see through it, and performance was terrible. So we looked at how do we make this better. We came up with Invoke Dynamic, which is much more friendly to JITs. Um, but we, at the time, we also said there's a second path we could take. We could give you dynamically bootstrapped constants instead. Um, and the expert group at the time explored this space and saw that the two things were equivalent. Anything you can do with uh, bootstrapped calls, you can do with bootstrapped constants. It's just slightly different choices along the way. So why, if you've got bootstrapped calls, do you still want bootstrapped constants? And the answer is that there's a fair bit of overhead if all you want is a constant. Right, so I'm going to start at the bottom of my, my slide here and work my way up. And the first thing is, if I want to return a constant, um, I have to wrap it in a method handle. So I've got at least one garbage object, uh, one thing I have to invoke to get my actual constant out of it. OK, so that's not terrible. The JIT's going to see through that and, and remove the overhead apart from this object that I have to keep alive. And then, because it's an invoke dynamic, it has to return a call site. And so I've got my second level of overhead I don't really want. I've got this call site object um, to hold on to my method handle that I didn't want either. 
And then my bootstrap method um, has to be able to handle this, and usually I want my constants to all you know, be constant and the same. And so there, you may need to do some level of interning in your bootstrap method. Um, and this is different with invoke dynamic because every invoke dynamic has a unique linkage state. Invoke dynamic is sort of the oddball bytecode in that way, in that you can't get away with using one constant pool entry um, and having everybody share that linkage state because each invoke dynamic has its own version of the linkage state. All right, so that's our invoke dynamic refresher course. What does Condi look like? Well, it looks an awful lot like Indy. We have a different bytecode in this particular case. I'm using LDC, but I'm LDCing my dynamic constant, and it's calling into a bootstrap method when it's unresolved. That bootstrap method is running off to figure out what the constant is. It returns the actual constant, and then I am permanently bound to that constant. Right? This is exactly the same game that we played uh, with Indy. We just removed the call site and the method handle. So already we're a little bit better in terms of overheads. All right, so Indy and Condi look an awful lot alike. And what I'm showing here are the bootstrap methods for both a Condi and an Indy. The Condi is on the top, right? They, they both share access to the same uh, attribute in the class file. That's the bootstrap methods array. Um, but the signatures for the bootstrap methods are slightly different. Everybody takes a lookup object. Uh, this is sort of your capability to look things up and your privileges. Uh, they all take a string, which is often a, a useful name, hopefully. Um, and then this is where they start to differ. In the case of a condi, uh, they take a class, and that class is the type of the constant you're going to return. And the VM will check that the constant is actually of that type. In the case of an invoke dynamic, you're returning, uh, you get a method type that describes what the type of the, the call is at that point, and the VM checks that as well to make sure your call site actually is of the right method type. Um, and then the thing you return from there is either the constant, uh, in the example I have here, it turns out to be a class, uh, or it's the call site in the case of the invoke dynamic. So right off the bat, as I said already, um, Condi resolves to the constant, and so we've removed two levels of indirection here. Um, and the other interesting thing with Condi is that it can be used anywhere a loadable constant can be. So a loadable constant is anything you can use LDC on, but that means that I can use Condi as an argument to another Condi. So I can have a set of constant dynamics that feed into another constant dynamic, or that feed into an invoke dynamic. Um, so I can start to build up all kinds of um, additional levels of uh, dynamics from my uh, constant pool. Um, and here I'll point out that the Condi linkage state is shared. So there's a single constant pool entry, and once it's resolved, all the Condi share that resolution state. So that's another difference from invoke dynamic. Okay, so why do you want Condi though? Right? There's a little bit of overhead in Indy, but by adding Condi, we've probably added, or hopefully added, the last or you know minus one or two uh, constant pool types we'll ever have to add. Um, you know, famous last words. But there are a lot of constants in in the VM that we can't encode in the constant pool. Right, right off the bat, we can't encode null. Can't put enum constants in the constant pool. Can't put primitive types. Um, uh, sorry, primitive type mirrors, so int.class or uh, boolean.class, and var handles. Right? All of these things are things you'd really like to be able to get access to from the constant pool. So in JDK 11, um, there's a set of standardized bootstrap methods that uh, provide um, well-optimized bootstraps to be able to uh, to get these kinds of constants. The previous way of doing this was to build yourself some kind of protocol where you encoded some strings into the constant pool and you had the right kind of bootstrap method that knew how to convert those strings into what you wanted. Uh, and so by putting this into the JDK, we've made it easier for everybody to do this and everybody gets the same code for it, which is generally a win. So what, what do these bootstrap methods look like? Um, they're in a new class called uh, Javalang Invoke. Uh, 
uh, constant bootstraps, and they do all the sort of interesting things you might want. Um, you know, you can get a constant for null from this. You can get a primitive class, enums, uh, read and read some static fields. Uh, the interesting one in the middle here is you can actually invoke a method handle, and so whatever that method handle was going to do is something that you return the result of that. Um, and then you can also get var handles out of this. All right, so this is all about making your life easier. These are in the JDK, use them. Preferable to uh, writing your own versions of them. So having added uh, Condi, you know, we typically have some best practices on, on what to do with these kinds of things. And so let's jump into those. And the first one is, as I've already said, use the, the constant bootstraps from the JDK whenever you can. Um, these are optimally, uh, hopefully optimally written and will continue to improve in the JDK so you get the best results out of using these. And they tie in nicely with some of the features that are coming in 12 as well. Um, if though you do find a reason that you have to write your own bootstrap method, make sure that it's item potent. And so that means that if you give it the same inputs, it's going to give you the same outputs every time you do it. And the reason for this is that um, constant dynamic in, uh, resolution is racy, just like invoke dynamic resolution. Um, so if two places are attempting to resolve, if two threads are attempting to resolve the same uh, constant dynamic at the same time, they're going to race, your bootstrap method might get called multiple times. Everybody is going to see the same result, but um, if your bootstrap method depends on how many times it's invoked, you might get odd answers. Uh, the other thing to point out is that resolution races aren't only within a single method because the constant pool result is shared by everybody who references that same constant pool. So you might race between uh, an LDC in one method and the same use of that constant pool entry as a bootstrap method argument somewhere else. So the next practice is use a meaningful name. This is just a, you know, an extension of the usual thing of use good variable names. Uh, this makes the life of people reading your byte code way easier when you use names that are meaningful. Um, so the first example I have here is using one of the constant bootstraps for getting a primitive class. And so the name there is, a, is, is Z. And so if 